Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining my session on seamless MLOps with Seldon and, and MLflow. Uh, you may be wondering who am I? So first introduction. So uh, my name is Adrian. I'm a machine learning engineer at Seldon. I joined Seldon. I joined Seldon like a year ago, and uh, I'm. Before that, I took a master's in machine learning, and before that, I spent a few years working as a software engineer. So I have that kind of mixed background between engineering and machine learning, which is what really makes me very interested in this kind of, of engineering questions around machine learning and machine learning systems. Next, you may be wondering about what Seldon. So Seldon is a company, a very small startup that focuses on machine learning deployment. So essentially how to take your models from the training state to the production state. And we, we are right now around 22 people. We are very passionate about open source. We, in fact, like our main open source product is, our main product is open source is to have a few other libraries. And we also collaborate with, with some other big open source projects like, like Dave Serving, which is part of, of the Qflow umbrella. Uh, also, same list back here, uh, we are hiring. So feel free to reach me if you have any questions about that or otherwise check that URL. Um, happy to help you with that. Cool, so what are we gonna see today? So we are gonna start first by uh, talking about MLOps and why, talking about why MLOps is a hard problem essentially. And I'm sure that you must have heard already a lot about MLOps in this conference. So sorry for talking about it again, but I think it's just really important to set the right problem to figure out what problem we want to solve before jumping into possible solutions. So essentially we're gonna go around that and we are gonna see afterwards how we can solve some of the parts, some of the problems with MLOps for with combining leveraging MLflow and Seldon. And afterwards, we'll just do a quick demo uh, showing uh, some of the power of both and, and how, how, how good they complement each other. So first of all, why is MLOps hard? So if we think about any kind of machine learning project, Usually the first thing that comes to your mind is, well, let's grab a data set and let's try to train a model with that data set. And for that, just spin out your Jupyter instance and you go and you try to train that model in your notebook. However, you soon realize that notebooks don't scale by themselves. So it's very common to end with this kind of pattern where you have a bunch of notebooks. Uh, it's very hard to know what's on each other. It's very hard to test. It's very hard to, to, to version control, to code review, et cetera, et cetera. Just to make clear, just to clarify, I don't have anything against notebooks. Notebooks are great, but they are a tool that has been really, really overused and tried to use for things that it wasn't designed for. We need to think of notebooks as what it is. It's just scripting for machine learning. You wouldn't, if we take the analogy to, to classic web apps, for example, you wouldn't take a script and just put it into production. You want to think about testing, you want to think about CICD, you want to think about containerization, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, we need to keep in mind that usually training is not the end goal. We want to somehow expose our model. We want to make our model usable by people. And it could be people, could be third party services. It could be other data science team within the company, it could be other things. But training is just a part of the machine learning life cycle. So we have to think also about data processing. So how this process usually looks like, and this is just a very high level overview. You usually have data processing where you would be doing any kind of data cleaning, any kind of feature processing, et cetera, to then go into training where you would do the actual training of your model and actual experiment tracking, et cetera. And then you would ex expose that, you would deploy that to serve your model. and this is, it's one of these steps, it's actually very massive. So if we think about how notebooks work, it, it just can't fit all of this, all of this entire life cycle. So we usually need to think, uh, so if we look at data processing, for example, we need to think about keeping track of the data lineage, keeping track of managing the different workflows that we need to clean our data, labeling our data. If you think about training, we need to think about how to distribute the training, how to do experiment tracking, how to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If we think about serving, we think about packaging our model and then all the other day two concerns like monitoring our model, audit trails, et cetera. 
So where does MLOps fit in here in this entire life cycle? Well, if we take, I just took this definition out from the Wikipedia and I know that you shouldn't take, you shouldn't quote Wikipedia, but I just really like this definition. I was looking for a definition for MLOps and this one I think just nails the, the, the right place. I, I think it's great. MLOps, compound of machine learning and operations, is a practice for collaboration and communication between data scientists and operations professionals to help manage production ML lifecycle. So from here, uh, we, we can see what, thing, what kind of things MLOps tries to solve. And we can also infer what things make MLOps hard. So if we think about the different challenges that we find in the machine learning life cycle, we have on one hand, we have, for example, a wide range of heterogeneous, very heterogeneous requirements. So for example, if we focus on the training part, we would usually have different data science teams in our organization. It's one of them maybe using its own framework, maybe because they prefer it uh, and they have expertise in that framework, or maybe just because they, they just use it for a specialized purpose, which makes sense for that framework. So, and you don't want to constrain which frameworks they want to use. So for example, one of them may be using TensorFlow, the other one may be using PyTorch, the other one may be using Exibus. So here you really have an axis of variability that you need to think about when you kind of design this ML lifecycle. You also need to think about the different infrastructure requirements that you may have across each one of these stages because they are very different between them. So for example, if you focus on training, the training state, the infrastructure required by the training state may, may for example, mean a massive range of GPUs because you want to distribute your training across all of them. But then serving may not need all of that power and you don't want to pay for that power in, in serving. So you need to think about this kind of concerns. Some of the steps in the ML lifecycle are also technically very challenging. So if you think, for example, about monitoring your model, this is just this is not measuring CPU, this is not measuring memory. This is maybe detecting that a data point at inference time is an outlier, or that the data set coming at you at inference time is drifting away from your training set. These are technically challenging problems by, by themselves. You also need to think that it's one of the models that you train need to go through this entire life cycle. So you need to think about how to scale that up. And then last but not least, which I think this is the most important point, it's organizational talent that MLOps gives you. So if we think, for example, of DevOps, DevOps was meant to solve the barrier between the engineering teams and the system administrators. There was a wall in between and DevOps was trying to break that wall. In the end, I guess it was kind of a mixed result. But let's look at in that, in that. If we think then about MLOps, we need to bring to that set of walls, we need to add another one with the data science team. And we need to add another one probably with the data engineering team. We need to think about how to overcome each one of these barriers. DevOps, for example, try to solve this by automating as, many, as much processes as possible so that you would give the power to, for example, engineers to own their own the particular infrastructure. And we, we're gonna see how we can reach to a similar level so that data scientists can own their model in production as well. And now, how are we gonna do that? So in this session, what we're gonna see is how MLflow for training and Celdon Core for serving kind of fit that purpose. And we're gonna start with MLflow. So first of all, what is MLflow? So you are in this conference, so I imagine that you really know uh, quite a lot about MLflow, but just to kind of uh, get our context together. So MLflow is basically an open source project. It was initially started by Databricks and is now part of the LFAI. They donated the project to the LFAI, I think beginning of this year. I think by the way, the LFAI is probably not called LFAI anymore. I think now it's the LFA and data, but let's not get into that. So essentially MLflow is an open source platform to manage the ML lifecycle, including experimentation, reproducibility, deployment, and a central model registry. So this is a quote coming from their, their website. How does this look like in practice? So 
essentially, MFLOW manages different, different concepts that let you model this life cycle, at least on the training state. So first of all, you would have an MLflow project. MLflow project is kind of the superset of what you're trying to achieve for, with a particular model. So it, it would, it, it would uh, be comprised of different uh, experiment iterations, etc. So you would have your MLflow project, and with your MLflow project, you would run experiments within your MLflow project. These experiments and these results are tracked into a, a MLflow tracking server which is essentially responsible of holding all the results of our experiments and all the different hyperparameters that we set on its iteration. You can also lock the output of these experiments as a train model. So this would, for example, mean the different iterations of your model across over time. Now, these models can, so in the demo that we'll see later, we are gonna serialize these models to our local file store. However, in a production setting, you would serialize this into a cloud storage bucket somewhere. So this could be something like S3, could be something like Minio, a local Minio cluster in your infrastructure, could be uh, Databricks uh, DBFS if you wanted to keep it all in house with Databricks, or it could be uh, Google Cloud Storage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think also has support for a wide range of uh, storage providers. On top of this, you also have the MLflow model registry. So the MLflow model registry would essentially allow you to keep track of each one of the situations of its model, as well as managing some metadata that comes alongside its model. Now, what is this metadata? What are we talking about here? So metadata here could be who trained this model, when did they train it, but also it could be more abstract things, like a which state is this model? Is this model considered uh, a testing experiment? Is it a stable experiment? Has it been approved by someone? As well as any kind of arbitrary metadata. So to recap on this, we have these four components. From here, probably the most important and the one that we're gonna focus on the demo to keep things simple are the project and the model. So the project is where, again, uh, to re-emphasize, you would define your environment, i.e. your dependencies, the your versions, your uh, set of parameters, which parameters you've got in your model, and the how do you, how can MLflow train and interact with that model. And then the MLflow model would be the snapshot, the serialized version of a particular experiment, experiment iteration. How do these actually look like? So on one hand, the MLflow project is encoded into an ML project file. This ML project file has a name, for example, here would be MLflow talk, and also has a pointer to an environment, to a description of an environment. So in here we are describing our environment using Conda. And we've got a Conda YAML file, which essentially has a list of all of our dependencies with a version uh, linked to each one of them. It also defines what are the parameters of your model. So for example, here we would have two parameters, alpha and L1 ratio. And as you could imagine, these parameters correspond to usually to actual hyperparameters of your model. So these are the things that you would tweak on its iteration to on, on its experiment iteration to train uh, to, to to optimize your model. Last, lastly, it has the command or how it can interact with any arbitrary training script. Uh, MLflow, this is an important point. MLflow tries to not get in the way with your training process. So let's say you've got something super complicated. It tries not to get not to get in the way. Instead, it just sorry. Instead, it just lets you define how it needs where it needs to plug those parameters in order to, to train a model. And then the script itself is the one that will be capturing the output of that model. Now how we can run this it's as simple as just, if you've got the MLflow package installed, it's as simple as doing like MLflow run, pointing to where your ML project is, setting the right hyperparameter values that you want to set, and that's it. On the other hand, the output of this training is an ML model. So this is a snapshot of your model. This is something that MLflow does underneath when you log a model. It's gonna create an ML model file, which essentially has uh, has flavors, which is a concept of MLflow, and it's essentially a way 
is a different ways of using and importing vector models. This is particularly relevant for the serving states because it's going to define how you're going to use your model afterwards, your train model. So for example, Seldon Core only supports the Python function flavor for right now, which means that your model needs to be serialized, needs to be able to get serialized into Python function, which is a more generic flavor in Emulflow. Other things that we can see here are, we can see that the model was serialized in pickle uh, in a file called model.pickle, which is alongside our ML model file. And you can also see the, the the loader function, the function that we need to use in order to load it back. We can also have for each of these models a run ID, which is essentially an ID that links back to our experiment. Now we're not going to show this in the demo, but for example, this could be used to link back a model running in production to where it came from. This is a really powerful thing. We can also see here the MLflow UI, which is essentially this MLflow tracking interface, which is where we're going to be able to see the output of our training. So for example, here we can see two, two experiment uh, iterations. One of them had two settings of, each of the hyperparameters to 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and a set of metrics. And the other one has just different values and different, which results in different metrics. Just to re-emphasize and to recap, it's one of these experimentation uh, iterations will have, an, will have a, a touch snapshot of a model. So it's one of these, we'll have a model. And we're going to see later how in Seldon we can, can actually take this model and just deploy it to try it out or to compare them between them or however we want. Cool. So talking about Seldon, let's just jump into that now. So. First of all, you may be wondering about what Seldon is or, or where it fits. And in here, I just like this view. This is basically, and linking back to the, ML, to the MLOps problem, it's another view into why MLOps is hard. So essentially, here on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, sorry, you would have all of the data problems, the data processing problems, configuration, data collection, etc. That's what would happen before in the ML lifecycle. You didn't have that black box in the middle, which would be the ML code. That would be your Jupyter notebook, essentially, or some other kind of notebook, but essentially the actual training code. And then you have everything else that comes on the right-hand side, so the green boxes, which are essentially what happens when you want to serve to expose that model. Now, this figure comes from a very famous paper by Google uh, called Hidden Technical Depth in machine learning systems, and it, it highlights the same MLOps problem, basically, in a different way. Now, Seldon fits in that right-hand side. Those are the kinds of problem problems that Seldon tries to, to solve. And we're going to see later how. But first of all, to, to keep talking about what actually is Seldon core, to get, getting a quote from the repo, an MLOps framework is an MLOps framework to package, deploy, monitor, and manage thousands of production machine learning models. Now, what does this actually mean? Or, or in, if we want to see this more graphically, so essentially Seldon Core allows you to go very easily from a set of model artifacts, which could be your MLflow models, your serialized models in the case of MLflow, to an API that can be consumed to run inference on, on that model. And it tries to make this process as simple as possible. Now, this process could be something as simple as just exposing a model, which is usually the first use case that you want to solve. But it could also grow more and more complex. So if you wanted to add multiple models to, your, to the same inference graph, and maybe have some kind of a smart router between them, or maybe you are interested in having some kind of pre-processing uh, so that you can transform the endpoint, the data coming directly to the public endpoint in some way, maybe this makes sense in NLP settings, for example. Or it can even grow more complex. So let's say for some reason now you have got a, so maybe you still have an MLflow model, but you've got any kind of custom requirement in, in your organization. That means that you can use the, like the out of the box inference server that comes with 
sell on for endless flow, you're still allowed to define your own set of, of Docker images that run this inference server. So you could extend the existing one to kind of kind of add any custom logic. All of this information is captured into what's called a custom resource definition. So essentially a custom resource definition is Kubernetes terminology to define an abstraction that will let you manage, will let you encode an architectural pattern that you know about into a single resource in Kubernetes. So for example, here, the cell on deployment CRD encodes the architectural patterns required to deploy machine learning models in Kubernetes into a single resource that just holds your model configuration. And we're gonna see later what, how this model configuration looks like. But essentially encoded on here, you would also have any kind of advanced uh, monitoring, logging, et cetera. Something else that also comes out of the box with Seldon, something that we just mentioned briefly, are a set of inference servers that will allow you to run, to, to, to deploy models trained in common, in the most common uh, ML frameworks. Also worth mentioning, uh, although I just mentioned it slightly, Seldon Core makes heavy use of the Kubernetes APIs. So it's, it's a cloud native solution that only runs on top of Kubernetes. The plus side of this is that it allows it to run on all major cloud providers, basically because you can have Kubernetes cluster in each one of them, or even on on-prem solutions like uh, using something like OpenShift, which is like an easier to use Kubernetes distribution, not easier to use, more robust, enterprise ready, maybe. Now, how does this work? How does this act, this CRD actually look like? So we've got here an example of a instance of the cell on deployment uh, custom resource, which is what we've got on the left hand side. So we can see that it has a name, example model, and we can see that it defines uh, it defines the predictors. It defines a single predictor, which has a graph object, a graph field. Inside this graph field, we've got the definition of our inference graph. So we can see that it has first a transformer node, which is gonna be a node that's gonna transform the input that comes into the inference graph from the outside. We've got a combiner node that is gonna gather the output of two models, which are gonna receive this transformed input. And in particular, if we focus it in these models, we can see that one of them, the one called classifier, actually has an implementation field that says it's an MLflow model. It's, it's gonna use the MLflow inference server. This is one of the inference servers that comes out of the box with Selden. And it's essentially gonna allow you to just point to a set of weights stored in, in the cloud to expose your model from there without any kind of further configuration. So for example, here, you can see that the model URI field just points to a URI in, in Google Cloud Storage. However, it still gives you power to control is one of these inference, is one of these inference nodes. And in fact, if you look at the field just above, component specs field, on that one, we override the image, the Docker image used in, in, in some on the on the other three inference nodes. So we are able to say this node is just gonna run this Docker image. I don't care about any prepackaged inference server. I just want to run this, this Docker image, and that's fine. And in fact, this also lets you override any kind of thing that you can change in a pod spec. Now, what happens under the hood when you apply this model? So when you run like you've got to apply of this deployment of YAML file, what would happen is Selden would create a bunch of resources for you. Probably the most important, the one we want to focus about here is the pod. And the pod would just have a set of containers. Some of these containers are gonna be are gonna map one to one to the inference nodes that you had in your deployment YAML, in your solo deployment custom resource. For example, we consider that we've got the input transformer node, the my model node, the classifier node, the model combiner node. And just to re-emphasize, the classifier node, for example, here would just run, it's just gonna be running the prepackaged inference server for MLflow. 
Other containers that we have in this pod, which are injected by Selden, are on one hand the INE container. The INE container is a sidecar container that is going to be responsible for downloading the model. So for example, in this case, we have a single node, the node classifier, which is just pointing to a model URI in the cloud, in a container that is responsible of fetching those weights, making them available to, to the model container. And it does this before everything else happens. Now, the second sidecar, sidecar container that we can see is the orchestrator. The orchestrator is essentially responsible for receiving all input requests and moving them along the, the, the inference graph as it sees fit. So for example, here, it would receive that request, send it first to the input transformer, to transform the input, it would then send it to the my model and classifier, it would receive the, the output of those, and then it would just send those down to the model combiner and get the output and back to the user. Now, focusing on these inference servers, this one's essentially allowed you to very quickly, in a very streamlined way, deploy models coming from different runtimes, from different machine learning toolkits. You can see them as runtimes. So for example, here, we would have our Kubernetes cluster. In our Kubernetes cluster, we would have a seldom deployment custom resource deployed called Model A. Now, Model A it specifies that it's going to use the MLflow inference server, the prepackaged MLflow inference server. It's just going to point to a URL in the cloud to fetch those Model A weights, which is going to be, again, the snapshot that came from our ML model, our uh, MLflow model. However, you could also have a cell on deployment custom resource called Model B that just points to the Exiboost prepackaged inference server, which means that you can just point your weight to our bro uh, BST file i.e. the snapshot, the output of training against the boost model. And this links back to one of the problems that we mentioned before. So one of the problems with MLOps is the heterogeneous requirements that we can see across teams, even within the same organization. We've got MLflow that solves for those at training time. So with MLflow, you are able to kind of give the user a unified training layer so that they can train and serialize models coming from any framework. Maybe not from any framework, but from most frameworks. And then with Seldon Core, you've got a unified deployment layer that lets users deploy models coming again from any model. You're also not restricted to the subset of, of, of inference servers. You can also define your custom ones. So for example, you could just grab uh, you could very easily, by just extending one of the interfaces in, in the Seldon Core package, you could very uh, roll up a Python inference server very quickly. Maybe for some kind of custom requirement, maybe for a framework that we don't support. However, Seldon also gives you out of the box a lot of pre-built things and opinionated solutions for all, let's call them day two, concerns. So first, you usually are concerned about getting your model into a server that you can query. But then the next step is what happens once you have that server, to, that model deployed. You need to think about monitoring. You need to think about logging. You need to think about a set of things that seldom comes out of the box with integrations for. So for example, for monitoring, out of the box, it will log uh, a set of, of metrics, usually uh, more DevOps-oriented metrics that can be scraped by Prometheus. And I'm not gonna spend more time here because we will see some of this later in the demo. Sometimes though, DevOps metrics like memory CPU are not enough. This is something that we mentioned about. When you're monitoring a machine learning model, you need to think about more advanced metrics, let's say. And for those, we leverage Knative to be along a synchronous pipeline that allows us to compute some things on each one of the data points that comes into our model. The reason for leveraging Knative is that we can build an asynchronous pipeline very easily that won't affect the latency of our inference process. Because usually these are heavy things. Usually each one of these is a machine learning problem on its own. For example, if we look at outlier detection, uh, we, we use 
one of our other open source libraries called Alibi Detect that essentially implements for you a bunch of algorithms for outlier detection and drift detection and any kind of, of monitoring problem that you've got in your production machine learning system. We also leverage Alibi by Detect to build a drift detection pipeline and a synchronous pipeline running K-native under the hood that is going to run drift detection for you or any set, any set of custom metrics, which could involve something relevant to your use case or it could be things like you know, accuracy, things like that, if you have access to a ground truth. These can go back to Prometheus so that they can be shown uh, to Grafana if you want to, or they can be, or you can set some kind of alert manager alerts uh, it's built into Prometheus to alert you whenever something wrong happens. Other things that Selden deals with are auditability. So in a similar way, following a similar architectural pattern as we saw before with Knative, Selden Core also allows you to log any input payload and any predicted value by your model to Elasticsearch. This allows you to keep track of all the things that your model is predicting so that you can go back on them and see what it did, which is important, uh, particularly important in some industries. Other data concerns are explainability. We have another library, another open source library called Alibi Explain that essentially deals with, essentially deals with, it pre-implements for you about a set of explainer algorithms that you can run in for, for on your model to kind of explain predictions. So you can imagine now how everything links together. So you can, on this single custom resource, you can define a set of things. Like for example, you can link your model with an explainer and an explainer type so that any kind of, of, of input payload that comes to, into your model can be explained very easily. And all of this is self-contained in, in that abstraction, in that custom resource abstraction. Other things that we can have in Seldon Core are advanced deployment models, which are particularly relevant for, for machine learning. You're going to see more in the demo about why is this relevant so I'm just not going to spend much more time on this. But essentially, you're able to run uh, A-B tests, which we will do later, or set of deployments or other more advanced uh, deployment models. And with that, uh, I think we are ready to go into the demo. However, before that, and just to kind of set the state right, I just want to describe a bit more what we're going to see. So. What we're going to do in the demo is we're going to show how all of these different pieces link together between them. And for that, we're going to think of a use case, for an example, use case. In particular, we're going to want to build, we're going to build a wine e-commerce. We can think of a wine e-commerce, a website that just sells wine. And as part of that, we want to provide a score for each one of the wines that we sell. So for that, we're going to train a model that predicts this wine quality for new wines. However, we want to also listen to feedback from the customers to see how well each one of the models matches to the tastes of our customers, which is where things get tricky. So we're going to need to implement some kind of feedback loop. But first things first, you would usually go try to find a data set. We've got here a data set, a wine quality data set that just describes a set of features about your wine. Um, I don't expert in wine, so. I'm just going to assume that this makes sense. And it has a quality at the end that it's one of the rows of the, of the wines. We will use an elastic net model to train this a predictor, this data set, to predict the score, the quality of each one of the wines. Now, elastic net is very simple. It's just uh, linear regression with the addition of two regularizers, an L1 and L2 regularizers, and a couple of hyperparameters, A and B, that are just associated with each one of the regularizers. So as you can imagine, we are going to want to tweak these hyperparameters to find what is the best setting of our model. And these are, it's important to remember that these are hyperparameters. So during training, we're going to find the set, set of beta weights, beta coefficients. But we will need to think of how to tweak A and B to find the right performance. So as you can imagine how we're going to do this with MLflow, at least for the training side, we're going to have a MLflow project, like a wine project, 
we're going to run experiments. We're going to keep track of those results in an MLflow ML tracking server. And for each one of these iterations, we're going to log the train model, which will usually have a different set of hyperparameters. Now, each one of these models will be serialized into a Google Cloud storage packet. Now, as I mentioned earlier, for the demo, this is just going to be a manual process. Usually in production, you would have MLflow directly configured to push models to uh, Google Cloud Storage so that you don't need to have that extra thing. And you would even have usually the model registry on top to kind of trigger deployments very easily. Now, we're going to have different iterations of our models. So one of the problems is going to be comparing, comparing them against them to see which one is best. You could argue, well, we've got a training data set that's just built for that. So let's just look at that. But maybe, just maybe, when you run into when you deploy these models into production, the performance reported by your training doesn't match with what you see in, in, in production. These are this can happen, for example, if well, I'm not sure about wine. So here is a big disclaimer. I'm not an expert in wine, but I can imagine in other things, for example, in clothes, in fashion, taste is change. Uh, what a customer likes change over time. There are trends. There are things that you don't think about sometimes, or even like new generations of people that like different things. So it's very important to compare these models in production. It's hard to compare which, which version of a model is on a workbench. You need to put them in production. And for that, what we're going to do is we're going to use this, this feedback loop to kind of read what the customer thinks about a particular wine. And we're going to do an A-B test between these two, uh, between two versions of the model to see which one is better. So thinking about that and how we're going to put that in production, the serving step would be defining a cell on deployment customer resource that's going to have these two models. And it's just going to define a 50-50 split between them. So essentially, it's just going to pull the models from the cloud storage where we put the trained models. It's just going to deploy them in a Kubernetes cluster. And it's going to expose that to a user. This looks quite complicated, but if you look at the custom resource, it's very, very simple. So essentially, you just have a cellular deployment CR, which has two predictors. The first one, both, well, both of them are going to use the MLflow inference server. The first one is just going to point to the weights of model A, which is one of the iterations of our training. And the second predictor is just going to point to the weights of model B, which is the second iteration of our training, or, or a different one. And it's just going to define a 50-50 split of traffic between them. And lastly, what we're going to do on top of this is adding an inference loop that is going to uh, is going to receive a reward signal. Now, this is something built into Celadon. It, ac it accepts feedback from its prediction. You can sometimes define that feedback, give that give that feedback back as the with the ground truth. But most of the time, you're not going to have the ground truth. For example, here, what is the ground truth about wine quality? You, you, you need that. Uh, you wouldn't need this. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a raw reward signal that is going to come from the values that the customer says about that wine. So a customer is going to buy a wine, which has a score of seven. It's going to say, well, this is actually a five or a four, if I'm generous. So we are just going to take that difference, uh, the inverse, because reward has to be positive, a positive signal, to say how well our model is performing. And we're just going to see how these models compare in in, in, in Grafana. So we're going to report those metrics. We're going to see in real time how they how they perform, how they, how they compare. So with that, we can jump straight into the into the notebook and, and have a look. Right, so I've got the notebook open here. So first of all, just wanted to like get them out of the way. So there are like a few prerequisites that I just have set up on my on my environment to save time. But essentially, you need to have MLflow installed. Uh, this is all available in a repo, so feel free to go to it to, to get to it, and you can just run it. Uh, so we've got some some Python requirements. We the example also assumes that you have a Kubernetes cluster set up and that you've got access to that cluster, and that you've got Selden Core installed on it. I've linked to instructions here on how you can do this uh, fairly easily. Uh, and last but not least, you also need uh, Grafana and Prometheus is installed on that cluster. So in here, I'm just using 
a Helm chart that Celadon Core provides with essentially installed Grafana, Prometheus, pre-configures that with Celadon Core, and 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 also creates a dashboard for you, a model dashboard for you out of the box. Cool, so first let's go into training. So in here I've got an MLflow file defined. This is very similar to the one we saw in, in, in the slides before. So it just has this environment, this conda YAML environment. Uh, we can look at it and it just has a few dependencies set up. It's fairly simple. One of them is scikit-learn with a version. Now, scikit-learn is very, is very is very sensible is, is is very sensitive sorry to the version particularly when you want to serialize it and deserialize it so it's good to have it pinned to a particular version now the with this in place we can just run our training and in here for example i'm just going to run it setting the alpha hyperparameter of the elastic net to 0 0.1 and we can see it runs so this is going to read that conda yaml is going to install any kind of missing dependency. It's going to run our training script, and it's going to save the output into into our local folder. In this case, uh, I've pre-run a second uh, a second iteration, setting alpha to one point Now we can look locally at how these look like all these files. So essentially, we would have just a bunch of folders. It's one for each iteration of our experiment. Uh, as I said before, usually you would have this in a some kind of cloud storage. We can also have uh, run MLflow UI uh, to kind of see them. And here, I'm just going to switch very quickly to a very bright and wide window. So sorry about the burn retinas. But essentially here, yeah, you can we can see all of the experiment iterations. And we can see that it's for each one of them, we've got a setting of the hyperparameters. We know the user who trained them, and we know the reported metrics. So here in particular, in this example, we're going to get these two. I think it's these two. And we're just going to deploy them and pitch them side to side in an A-B test with production data. We're going to simulate production data. We can also look further at how this looks like. So essentially, you just have and it's one of the ML model has what, well, as we said, uh, flavor. So, for example, Python function, function it has some instructions on how you can read it back, as well as some metadata. Now, here is the step that you usually wouldn't need in a production setting, which is taking the output of your training of each one of the iterations and deploy and pushing it, uploading it to a cloud uh, remote storage cluster. Usually, MLflow would automatically when you log a model would just push it to the cloud or push it to some kind of storage packet. And why in this case we need this in particular is because Selden, when we, it serves the model, is going to need access to these weights. So in here, I'm just going to manually push them into a Google uh, uh, Cloud packet, which is just going to be called like Selden uh, model, Selden flow model A. Now, Moving on, the next step is going to be to deploy our model. So now we have trained them. We've got them in, in, in Google Cloud Storage, and we're going to deploy them. Now, for that, we just need to define a cell on deployment custom resource, an instance of the custom resource where we can see uh, where we can see a few things. So first of all, it has a name, one is classifier, and then it has two predictors. Now, the first part of the predictor is very similar to what we saw earlier. So it's just defining a graph where we are going to have a single node in this case, which is going to use the MLflow server implementation. And it's just going to point to the weight to the URI in model A. And it's just going to get 50% of the traffic. This is the first predictor, the model A. We, look at, we can also see here that it has, uh, we're seeing a big chunk here. This is one of the trade offs of having that dynamic environment that the YAML file. As we will see later, when you deploy a model, with the MLflow server, it's going to read that conda YAML, which again is stored here remotely in this URI. And it's going to instantiate that environment for you. Now, because this environment is completely dynamic, you can't have anything pre built. You need to do this at any time for each one of the instances of your model, which is a fairly costly process. This is a trade off of having that dynamic environment. So, in here, essentially, what we do is we're going to tell Kubernetes, well, it's fine that this container in particular takes more time to come up. Just give it time because it needs to install the environment. 
So, which is essentially what we do here. And we can do that because through the component specs in, in the cell deployment CR, you're able to override any kind of bot spec change that you want to, to have. Now, the workaround to this, the alternative is to actually have a hard-coded environment with a set of dependencies there, which you can also do. It's just a trade-up. You need to decide which one you want, that dynamic environment with slow performance coming up or a hard-coded environment with no dyna dy dynamicity to it. Dynamicness? I don't know. Uh, the second predictor is going to be uh, the, another MLflow server, which is going to point to model B. And it's also going to get 50% of the traffic. Now, we're going to do this, and we're going to just apply it. Now, we can see uh, what's happening on our cluster. This is a view into our Kubernetes cluster, where we can see that there is a seldom deployment resource uh, getting created. And this is the, the resource that we just created. We can look at the pods, and we can see that it's creating two different pods, one for each of our predictors. So if we look at the first one, for example, we can see that first of all is instantiating the sidecar, the storage initializer that is going to, is just going to download our models. If we look at the logs, and secondly, we can see that there is this MLflow server REST, which is just the MLflow server inference, the MLflow inference server. If we look at the logs of this container, we can see that it's actually creating the conda environment, is reading it from the conda YAML, and is instantiating everything. Now. This takes a while because it's going to need to download all of the dependencies. So while it's doing that, uh, you may also be wondering about, OK, so we've got two pods. How does it know that it needs to do a 50-50 traffic split on it? When you do this kind of test, this kind of deployment, this kind of inference graph of an A-B test, seldom by default will do that split at the ingress level. The reason for doing it at the ingress level is that then you can leverage something like Istio to do that split between the, these two containers, this, these two pods, which is going to be faster than doing it in a single pod. So if we look, for example, at the virtual services in our cluster, once they come up, uh, they will appear now. Because it takes a bit of time, I imagine now it must be installing the dependencies. I've got here in the background a namespace where these pods have already been created. and. Uh, and they are just up. And we can look at it has this virtual service already created here. And if we look at any of them, uh, we can see that it has these two, this 50-50 split between them. Now, the next step is to test these models. So we can see that the pods have been created. We can see that we've got a cell on deployment. We can now deploy this. We can now send a test request to this. And for this, I'm just going to send it to the uh, backup namespace. So we send a request. The request is just going to this endpoint, and it just needs to follow this particular schema. And we can see that the output just gets the predicted quality for that particular one with that set of attributes. Now the next step is going to be to actually simulate traffic and see how we can implement that feedback loop. Now for that, we've got the simple script, which is just going to simulate traffic coming uh, based on the CSV, which we use to train our model. So it's going to essentially going to get each one of the rows, it's going to send it, and then it's going to send as as reward the sort of uh, a metric based on, on the square distance between the predicted value and the actual value. And it's just going to send that to the feedback endpoint. Now, I'm just going to kick that off in the background here. And this script is just going to run forever. And if we go into Grafana, we should be able to see now how this traffic starts to appear here. Because Grafana takes a bit of time, I think we should be able to go back a bit more. And we should be able to see here a previous run where we started to report uh, rewards for our models. For example, here, here you can see the pre-built dashboard for your models. And you can see how it's reporting the reward for each one of them. Besides the reward, it also keeps track of, of the requests that are getting. And in here, you should be able to see, I guess Grafana is just taking a bit of time to refresh, how the request rate for each one of the models is actually 50-50. And, and that's pretty much it for the demo. Cool, so with that, thanks a lot for joining the session uh, again, just we are hiring, 
So feel free to read to me. And also don't remember to give uh, feedback uh, about the session. Any kind of feedback is welcome. And also please feel free to ask any questions on the chat. But yeah, thanks a lot for your time.